Thank you very much, James. And it's a pleasure to be back at Bath. It's a long time since I was here. And this book, which I'm going to talk about and called Blue Commons, Rescuing the Economy of the Sea. I have a few copies, if any of you are interested at the end. And it, in a sense, it's the concluding book of a series. Uh, James mentioned the precariat, which has gone viral and taken me all over the world. And I wrote a book, a follow-up book called The Corruption of Capitalism, essentially saying that the neoliberalism of the 1980s associated with Thatcher and Reagan and all the Chicago school and everything created a new form of capitalism, rentier capitalism, where more and more of the income is flowing to the owners of property, financial property, physical property, and intellectual property. And that the global architecture has turned the economy into this regulated source of rent that's going to the plutocratic uh, elements and interests and so on. And in writing those books, I realized that there's one area that was being eroded systematically was the commons. And we lost sight of the commons in our political discourse in the 20th century when it became the state versus private, that dichotomy. Whereas historically, all the great progressive movements in Britain and in other parts of the world have actually been about the defense of the commons, the defense of what belongs to all of us. The Peasants' Revolt, the Chartists, many, the Magna Carta, the Charter of the Forests. And it was writing that book in 2017, and I was an economic advisor to John McDonnell, the shadow chancellor, and to Jeremy Corbyn. I was trying to explain to them the importance of a progressive discourse through the commons. And 2017 happened to be the 800th anniversary of the foundational documents of the British constitution and the constitution of all democracies. Because on November the 6th, 1217, two charters were sealed by the King and by the Vatican's representative. One was Magna Carta. We're taught at school it was 1215, rubbish, 1217. And the other was the Charter of the Forest. And the Charter of the Forest remained longer on the British statute books than any other piece of legislation only being uh, repealed by the Conservatives in 1971. And the Charter of the Forest essentially said, the commons belong to everybody and the monarchy and the government must act as the stewards of the commons. And that goes to the point where I wrote this book, Plunder of the Commons, which I ended up actually presenting in the House of the Commons, and I said to myself, there's one area missing, and that's the blue commons. So that is the background of writing this book, which you'll notice is rather thick because I've been working on it on and off for, for many, many years. Now, two weeks ago, they passed in New York the Oceans Treaty. I wrote to the Guardian saying that I don't think it's up to much. And I'm doing a BBC program this week saying why well, I don't think it's up to much, but there's a euphoria at the moment about it. Guardian has just written a really, really incredibly ignorant editorial where it begins by talking about Garrett Hardin's The Tragedy of the Commons paper, which you should all know, written in 1968. Hardin was a racist. He was uh, a white supremacist. He, he was a Malthusian and he painted the natives as eating up all the resources and therefore depleting. And it was an argument for privatization. And yet the, the Guardian doesn't seem to realize by citing approvingly the beginning at the end, they cite him, how stupid that is. 
Okay, the commons is not like that. And you can go back, and as I ask, answer in, in the book, ask in the book, who owns, who owns the sea? Who owns the sea? But before I give you the answer to that, let me give you just a few stylized facts, because unfortunately, we have a green politics, but we don't have a blue politics. The blue is ignored. And yet, the sea covers 71% of the world's surface. We have a situation where 40% of the world's population live in coastal communities. Half the oxygen we breathe comes from the sea. The sea contains over three quarters of all life and global warming is affecting the sea more than the land. And economically, as I show in, in the book, economically, if the sea counted as a, as a country, it would already be the fifth largest economy in the world. And the World Bank and others are saying, if we're going to have future economic growth, it must be led by blue growth. And there are lots of reasons why they are pushing that line. And it's possibly correct, but very dangerous, as I tried to argue in the book. And yet, despite these things, only 1.6% of all development assistance has gone to anything to do with the marine economy, the marine communities, and so forth. So besides those stylized facts, which give you a background, there are a few stylized horrors that I highlight in chapter one. 400 million people will be displaced by rising sea levels within the next 20 years. Of the 28,000 known species of fish in the sea, over a third are in serious trouble, not reproducing faster than they're, being, they're dying. Every year, 11 million tons of plastic go into the sea except that it's rising. So probably this year, it will be 12 million. Worse still are what's called forever chemicals in the sea. And forever chemicals are really dangerous because they get into the sea, the small fish eat the chemicals, the bigger fish eat the small fish with the chemicals, but they stay in the bigger fish. So the bigger fish have much more pro rata in terms of dangerous chemicals. So the bigger the fish you eat, the more likely it's got dangerous chemicals to a dangerous degree. Meanwhile, there are 97,000 ships of 100 tons or more going all over the world's sea. In the sea, noise has terrible devastating effects on reproduction, and uh, breeding patterns and migratory patterns of all marine, cult more marine species. And yet the noise level has been doubling every decade since 1950. And mining that's taking place and increasing has devastatingly more noise than these big ships. Now, something like 120 million people are dependent entirely on coral reefs for their livelihoods in developing countries. Those coral reefs are disappearing at an incredibly rapid rate. Every year, bet, bet, bet you didn't know and I didn't know, that the second most used resource in the world is sea sand. And every year, 50 billion tons of sea sand are excavated from seashores and led by China, which is making the effort to expand its land mass by thousands of miles by excavating sand. And ironically, they're going around Taiwan, uh, excavating some of their sea sand, creating erosion of the, of the land. Next, stylized horror, when you go to Southampton, maybe you'll think of this, is that luxury cruise ships, they use the dirtiest bunker diesel. 
and they leave their engines on all the time they are in port. The result is that in communities around ports, the level of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide and so on, is extremely high so that studies show that over 50,000 premature deaths have taken place in the last decade around European major ports. We have a situation where the world's ports are expanding dramatically in size and number. There are about 835 ports, I estimate, and they've all been privatized and they're owned by either Chinese capital or financial capital private equity. Every single English port, 120, a British port, sorry, 120 of them are foreign owned, mainly owned by private equity or Chinese capital. And they're not answerable to the commons. I had a debate with Ed Miliband on a podcast and he didn't seem to realize that I said, look, go to the tea side. It's the port there is run by a Canadian private equity company. And they're disregarding all the commoners around. They're dredging hundreds of thousands of sediment, dumping the sediment out, poisoning all the local fish and crustaceans and the fishermen's livelihoods are being devastated. That's what's happening because they don't have an answer. They don't answer to the commoners. So those are a few of the few facts to, to bear in mind and see how problematical the developments in the sea are. But then come back to my question, who owns the sea? Well, you have to go back to ancient Rome and the Justinian Codex of AD 529 to 534. Justinian was a Byzantine, and when he became the emperor, he, he couldn't understand all the laws that existed in the Roman Empire. So he put a commission of jurists together and said, will you please make sense of law? And they came up with a very neat conceptualization that there are four types of property. There's private property, raised privity, state uh, property, public property, nobody's uh, property, res nullius, and common property. And as I show in the chapter, common property was accepted as a legitimate form of property quite distinct from nobody's property, open access. That's why uh, Harding got it so wrong. And the idea is that common property has the commons embedded in it. And what I try to do in the book, and I think this is possibly the, the only real claim I hope, or maybe that, that to useful things for students, as I try to conceptualize the commons in a way that is different from Eleanor Ostrom's famous conceptualization, and look at what defines the commons in terms of principles and what defines a commoner and what form of governance exists. Now, the thing is that the commons, first of all, must accept the public trust doctrine. The government or the monarchy or the state, whatever you want to call it, have to act as stewards, as trustees, with a duty to preserve the value of the commons. That's their duty. It is not their right or entitlement to use the commons in any way they wish. The commons are inalienable. And that is an important first thing. The second thing is what I've called, and I may be not original, I'm sure, the social memory principle. And what happened throughout British history and in other countries is that to start with, a commons, a social commons, was defined by the lovely term of time out of mind of man. It was a term used. And what it meant was you, if, if there was a piece of land or something that was a commons and somebody contested it, 
then they would call the oldest people of the community who would say, well, whether it has been treated as a commons for their whole life. And if it had, it was accepted. But this gradually became formalized by successive monarchs. And in 1623, the rule, the law became 20 years. So if it is, something had been accepted uncontested as a commons for 20 years, it was to be preserved as a commons. So our National Health Service became a commons in 1968. As, a, as an example. Now, an important principle of the commons going way back is what, again, I call, and maybe others have called it, the intergenerational equity principle. What that means is that not only does the trustee, the steward, have a duty to preserve the value of the commons for today, but they must preserve it for future generations. And that means what's been developed in economics called the Hartwick rule, that you can only distribute the benefits of the commons, that which will not diminish the value. That's very important with things like oil, uh, minerals, and so on. And that's why the Norwegians have developed this wonderful instrument for preserving their commons, their oil fund, whereas we dissipated it. And the various other things I don't have time to talk about, but the, the commons, and then you have to define who is a commoner, who belongs to a community. And you can do that. And then you have to think about the governance. Very critically for a commons, you must have not only stewards, but gatekeepers. And that is actually enshrined in the charter of the forest, even if it's written in language that is very difficult for us to understand in the 21st century, the idea of gatekeepers, holding the stewards to account, very critical. Now, how are commons lost? That's the next chapter. There can be neglect, there can be encroachment. They used to have traditions of checking for encroachment. There is big enclosure, that's the classic situation, the Tudors and the Victorians, the enclosure of land. The first thing that radicalized Karl Marx in the 1840s was the enclosure of the Mosel area. And that radicalized him, not capitalist exploitation in mills and factories, but it was the fact that seeing the enclosure taking the commons away and this commodification, and I develop in the book, the very idea that financialization of the commons has been a, a big feature of what's happened to the blue commons. Now, I won't go into that, but the next bit should be of interest to all of you. Because in, 19, in the 1950s, as a result of various conflicts, and a result of the United States in 1945, in what's called the Truman Proclamation. Truman suddenly announced that 200 nautical miles from all around the US coast was to be US territory. It's an act of imperialism that he, he took at the end of the war. This was immediately followed by Chile and Peru saying, hey, 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 hey we're gonna do 200 miles, okay? This led to a whole lot of conflicts, including the Cod Wars, in, in between Iceland and Britain and various other conflicts and various other countries started moving in that direction. This was a time of geopolitical conflict and tension between the Soviet Union and US and NC. So they began to negotiate what in 1982 became UNCLOS. Now UNCLOS is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And it was the brainchild of a wonderful man, Arvid Prado, a Maltese diplomat, who gave an electrifying speech in the UN in 1967. Beautiful speech in which he said, the danger of us losing the common heritage of mankind, as he called it, and seeing conflict and say, we must preserve 
the commons in the sea. But poor old Arbid, the end of Anklos, as I quote him as saying, he said, all that's left is a few fish and seaweed. Why was he so pessimistic? Well, what Anklos did was a series of compromises between the rich countries, Soviet bloc, and the G77 representing developing countries. And the first thing that they did was they universalized the 200 nautical mile limit. So all coastal countries were given enclosed exclusive economic zones for 200 nautical miles from their coast. Now, this happened to benefit two countries much more than any other. The United States got 11.7 million square kilometers. The second, but actually the first, was France. It got 11.8 million square kilometers of sea owned. The reason was, of course, that the French had a lot of island economies that they had their 200 miles from them. Third country was Australia, which got 8.5 million. Now, the agreement that has just been signed today or yesterday between Australia, the United States and Britain, I noticed it's to defend Australia's exclusive economic zone at 8.5 million square kilometers. Britain came fifth. Britain gained 6.8 million square kilometers. And what that meant was that as from 1982, the size of the sea means that Britain's sea area is 27 times as large as its land area. Now you think that's quite a thing. There are certain, certain countries like Kiribati, where it's 400 times as much. But okay, but then you look at the small print of what this part of UNCLOS was about. And there's one country that got less than 1 million, 900,000 square kilometers. And that happened to be China. Because in 1982, China was not a global power. Okay, so you cannot understand the geopolitical tensions in the South China Sea in particular without understanding the sense of injustice that the Chinese have. It's the same with India, which was the second biggest country in the world. It only got a bit over two million. Okay, more than in China, but certainly not anything like the, the countries I've mentioned. Now, this, this was the first part of UNCLOS. So you had the biggest enclosure in history by far, okay? Now enclosure is a prelude to privatization. Always been the case, and sure enough, that is exactly what has happened as a result of UNCLOS. Now, I'll come back if I have a time at the end to some of the implications, but since UNCLOS was passed, there's also been extensive ocean grab. The big powers have used excuses to ex expand from 200 to 350 mile, uh, uh, nautical miles. And 83 countries have taken advantage of a clause that allowed them to do that. I want to turn very briefly to the chapters four and five to give you the, the, the flavor of it, which is the two chapters mainly about fishing, global fishing. And one of the compromises in the UNCLOS of 1982 was that there should be benefit sharing for the whole world, all countries, including the 43 landlocked countries that don't have any access to the coast. And that in addition, they wanted to ensure access to fishing grounds of developing countries. And they had a concept developed by a cranky American uh, politician, civil servant, a bit of a weirdo, in 1949. 
He had a concept called the maximum sustainable yield. It really sounds scientific, MSY. And the maximum sustainable yield, I'm not joking when I say this, I, I promise, I'm not making it up, because it, sound, it will sound as if I may, must be making it up. The maximum sustainable yield was that, look, we must make sure that enough fish are catch, caught and killed to the upper limit, because that will mean getting rid of the older fish so that the younger fish will be able to breed because they'll have more space. Now I could repeat that, but I think you get the gist of it. A sort of Malthusian nutter in, in, the, in 1949. The only problem is it's still used today, that concept. It's still used. And what the UNCLOS did was it said that if a developing country is unable for technical reasons or whatever reason to fish up to the maximum sustainable yield, it had to make fishing access agreements with foreign countries. So subsequently, you will not be surprised that some 300 fishing access agreements have been signed, all giving the long distance fishing boats of Russia, the United States, China mainly, uh, Spain or whatever, access to fishing grounds that they can cap get up to that MSY figure. And you will find as a report that in actual fact, the share of the revenue from these fishing access agreements going to developing countries is something like five to eight percent of the total. This is pure neo-colonialism that hardly anybody is discussing, but it is a disgusting thing because it has led to huge declines in fish populations, the destruction of fishing communities, out-migration. You can't understand any of that process without understanding UNCLOS and these fishing access agreements. Today, China. In 1986, China had 13 boats capable of long distance fishing, you know, big enough and able to do it. Today, they have 17,000. And they go and they make agreements and essentially the fish populations are collateral damage. Now, when a country tries to put some sort of limit, they say, well, if you do that, I'm sorry, we're gonna call in your, your debts. We're going to stop aiding like they did with Kenya. We're gonna stop funding your railways that we're building if you do anything to protect your fish population. So there's a whole string. And the funny thing is, as I argue in the book, don't have time now to go into the details, but most of the international attention is focused on combating illegal, unregulated fishing unreported, illegal, and IUU is the faith. So the FAO and others, the World Bank, focus on that. The real damage is done by perfectly legal processes. Now, besides that particular story, um, we have another form of privatization. And uh, when I was telling John McDonald this story, he said, I didn't know it was that bad. But you, we operate fish quota systems. This is a sort of privatization by which governments sell or give permits to particular companies to be able to fish a certain amount of the total fish out there, according to total allowable catches, so-called scientific evidence, which they never respect. And 40 odd countries have these fish quota systems. And Britain's is particularly pernicious. Britain operates a quota system whereby that they're making the permits, the quota transferable, and they've gradually been accumulated into a very small number of corporates. So 13 firms, own, in effect, two thirds of all the quota for fish around Britain. And worse, one firm owns 23% of all 
the pelagics quota, herrings and mackerel and think sardines and things like that. And when they had Brexit debate, they lied through their teeth because it wasn't the common fisheries policy that is causing the distress in the British fishing populations. It's the quota system. The quota system, because that boat that had 23% happened to be a British registered Dutch owned boat of 114 meters long, long, the biggest in the whole fleet, right? Its sister ship is still operating. We're out, out outside the European Union. And worse, the British government has not applied any criminal procedures against these big corporations. In 2011, the Scottish famous case, the Black, the Black Scam event, you probably remember that, when 13, uh, sorry, five of the biggest fishing companies in Scotland were found to be involved in a scam of overfishing worth 63 million pounds. And why that story is interesting is that they weren't subject to criminal justice. They were treated as if it was a civil offense. So they didn't lose their quota. They didn't go to prison. They had to pay a fine, but that was it. And they could go on. And they're still the five richest, among the five richest in the Sunday Times list. And this boat that I mentioned, the Frank Bonaparte, Bonaparte it's called, was caught off the south coast with 632,000 kilos of illegally caught mackerel. That's a lot of mackerel, take my word for it. And it was taken into, into port and the captain and the owner were fined a total of 96,000 pounds. But then they were allowed to sell the fish and they made a profit of 432,000 pounds. Well, in my version of reality, that means crime pays, right? So that story I, I elaborate because there are other, other aspects, but I don't have time to go, to go into it. But the, the criminality of the quota system goes through the organizations that the government has set up and their refusal to change the law in the fisheries bill of 2020. I'll leave that for you to think about. The next chapter, which I'm writing a lot about at the moment because Ocean Rebellion have been pushing me to, to, to write on, is about aquaculture. Aquaculture is farming, farming of, of fish. In 1970, only 4% of the world's fish, the sea fish that we ate, was farmed. Today, it's well over 50%. And it's the fastest growing food uh, sector in the world by far, much more than any, anything on land. And the quota is the, that the aquaculture has a terrible tendency to be both ecologically destructive and disgusting, genuinely disgusting. I've described the processes by which Salmon farming is, is done, for example. And what, what aquaculture has represented is a conversion of the commons into the most extraordinarily rent extracting industry in the world. So that the big aquaculture companies make phenomenal profits, which has attracted global finance, private equity companies into it, and led to the conglomeration, because there are economies of scale, economies of scope of different parts of the chain of production. So that, for example, today, Maui, the Norwegian, the biggest producer of salmon in Norway, produces nearly a quarter of the world's salmon, one company. And it's run by a man who made his money, his initial money, for running crude oil for the Ayatollah in the Iran-Iraq war, from which he has been able to build up the, big, the world's biggest uh, oil tanker fleet. And he, over, he took over Maui and 
Maui has gradually absorbed all fishing, salmon fishing, except for a handful of left now. So anybody who's going to go out and eat Scottish salmon should realize that today, 99% of all salmon from Scotland is foreign capital production. Even to the extent where these Norwegian firms, Maui included, they import the, the salmon roe from Norway into Scotland to produce them from the hatchli hatchlings in Norway. So anyone, all that you've got is, is salmon water, okay, the, 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 the locks. But that is how dominant aquaculture. But in the developing countries, it's worse. Because what, what has happened is the World Bank money, other money, has gradually converted areas near the sea into farming areas for particularly prawns, but some other fish, and they've been using mangroves. Now, mangroves are important part, well, I've only got five minutes, I'm going to rush through this. Mangroves are important part of the whole ecosystem. 80% of all marine species relies to some extent on mangroves. And we've lost one third of all mangroves in the world in the last 20 years. Okay. Now, aquaculture, in my view, is a big problem and is subject to financialization. I won't go into it anymore because we're running out of time. But the, the next chapter deals with uh, an area which should be frightening every single one of us. And that's it's called the mining juggernaut. Under UNCLOS, there was to be no deep sea mining until a mining code could be drawn up and a sharing mechanism so that everybody gained equally was developed. I would remind you, this was 1982. They didn't set up the International Seabed Authority to do these things until 1994. We are now in 2023, and surprise, surprise, the ISA has not been able to produce either a code or a, sh a sharing mechanism. And this ocean treaty is promising to do the same thing. Why we should think that suddenly the world is gonna change? You can guarantee the United States will not ratify the Ocean Treaty, just as it's not ratified UNCLOS. Okay? So we have a situation where suddenly the little country of Nauru in June 2021, working with a huge Canadian mining company, noticed something in UNCLOS that I don't understand how so many others had not noticed it, a little clause saying that if a country applied to start deep sea mining, the International Seabed Authority had precisely two years to draw up a mining code and a sharing mechanism, or the country could go ahead. So in June this year, I'm predicting there will be a frenzy of deep sea mining starting all over the world. So far, contrary to what the Guardian said, there has been a control on it. If you want to do exploration, you had to get a license from the ISA and you pay, the companies paid 500,000 and as the budget of the ISA has been very small, they've been saying thank you very much and giving the licenses. But today we are facing a situation where every single marine scientist, knows and says that if deep sea mining starts, the devastation to the ecosystems of the world will be fantastically great. And here we are moving towards the sixth system. The German government has come out saying it must, something must be done. The Spanish has said the same. The British have kept remarkably quiet, remarkably quiet. It could be because one of their companies has one of these big licenses and is doing something in the 
Anyhow, that, I'll leave that. Now, I won't go into the rest except to mention one other story, which you might find of interest, which is, of course, that recently offshore wind farms have become sexy, right? And to the shame of the British monarchy, Queen Elizabeth, in her infinite scheming, decided to auction off our seabed. And in four rounds of auctions, the Crown Estate auctioned off thousands of square miles of our seabed, the commons, and turned them into owned, owned by multinational corporations, Germans, Swedes, Canadians, etc. And they allowing them to build these huge wind farms without doing environmental impact assessments, which is contrary to international law. Now, Charles seems to have shown a little bit of wisdom in his old age, has just announced magnanimously that the benefits of this auction will be coming back to the British public in some way. Well, we should be saying F off. It's not yours in the first place. Basically, the Crown Estate guaranteed itself billions of pounds of revenue flowing from the auction. It's a terrible scam. So I'll end with, with saying what the last two chapters are. The first is about governance. What institutional reforms can revive the commons ethos revive the commons, preserve the commons, and enable commoners to be back in control. What do you need to do? That's the subject. And the final chapter is saying this. And this, of course, anybody who knows me will know this is where I started, which is that if you take the commons away, either you take the commons from the commoners or you deplete the commons by treating it with lack of respect, so it neglect and pollution and everything lowers the value of the commons, then the commoners should be compensated. That is a principle of common justice. And I found that people, once you explain that, in the great length that I'm doing now, people get it. It's a matter of common justice. And therefore, I think what we need to do is see a progressive movement to building up what I call an eco-fiscal strategy where we have levies on those who are benefiting from taking from the commons. A carbon levy, an aquaculture levy, a um, fuel levy, or a number, I've got 17 altogether, and they bow into a fund, and as the fund builds up, you pay out common dividends to the common. Well, common dividends is another name for common property rights. And you could call it a basic income. And for me, this road into a basic income is very consistent with what the Norwegians have been doing with their wonderful Norwegian fund, such that they've made sure all the royalties have gone into the fund. As the fund's built up, they pay out a dividend to the state but now, technically, every Norwegian is a millionaire as a result of this, of this fund. And I proposed in the book that the, the aquaculture levy should be 40%, because it turns out that the aquaculture companies are actually only bearing about 50% or less of the costs of production. The rest is borne by outsiders, externalities. And beautifully, in September, the Norwegian government announced that they were going to introduce a aquaculture ground rent of 40%. Of course, this has immediately mobilized the aquaculture corporates, their billionaire owners, and financial capital trying to stop it. And they are frightening the Norwegian public by saying, oh, we're going to move out. We're going to move out. 
I just hope that the Norwegians can hold their nerve and I give them all credit for bringing it up in the first place. For me, this is the beginning of a counterattack, a beginning of something where if there's any virtue in the book, it is to bring attention to how important the blue commons and the blue economy is are today. And in that regard, make people more aware that we need a blue politics as well as a green. Thank you very much for listening.